I hope everyone's well. I hope you guys are having a good week. And this time we're going to be painting our first advanced landscape for this channel. Now this one's definitely on the difficult side, but I'm going to walk you through every step and all the techniques that I use to complete this. So hopefully it'll help you out with your landscape paintings. Of course, I wanted to keep this painting lesson as accessible as possible for most painters. So I simplified a few things. First up is that I'm using a limited palette. So you're not going to need that many colors for this one. I care way more about textures and values, and that's what this lesson is going to be about. About. I also want to point out that the majority of this painting is painted in transparent colors, so we're going to be using a lot of erasing and a lot of scratching techniques to pull out highlights. But for that sky and the smoky blurry look that we get on the mountains in the background, we're going to be using some opaques as well. And before we get into this lesson, I really want to thank the tier 2 members who help support this channel. So that includes Jeremy, Dwayne, M. Shibley and Andrew. So thank you so much, guys. And moving forward, I'm definitely going to be including some more polls on the members page so that you guys could vote and decide what you want to paint next. Now, I don't know if anyone noticed it yet, but this painting is based on a very famous landscape at the Metropolitan Museum of Art here in New York. If you're ever in New York, the Met is an essential place to visit. It's really one of my favorite art museums in the world. When you enter the American Wing, all you need to do is walk down this hallway to see Emmanuel Loitz's Washington crossing the Delaware, and once you get to that, you make a left into Gallery 765. Here you'll see a painting called the Merced River in Yosemite Valley, painted in 1866 by Albert Bierstadt. I've always considered Bierstadt to be one of the best landscape painters of all time. Born in Germany, his family moved to the United States when he was only an infant, and he's often grouped in with the Hudson River School artists like Thomas Cole and Frederick Church. Bierstadt came along a few years after these guys, so I'd consider him more of a post-Hudson River School artist or a second generational one. The founders of the Hudson River School took the aesthetics of romanticism and kind of combined them with nature to paint these almost biblical-like depictions of the American landscape. And as the name would imply, these artists painted from the scenery of the Hudson River Valley. The next generation of these artists expanded from this location, just as Albert Bierstead did, with the American West. Within these paintings, you're gonna see a lot of exaggeration filled with dramatic lighting, which was sometimes referred to as luminism. It's important to know that these works were idealized representations of the American West, again, influenced by the romantic painters in Europe from the end of the 18th century. A lot of these paintings were enormous. The one we're looking at right now of the Sierra Nevada is six feet high by 10 feet in length. So it's almost overwhelming when you see these in person. Now, of course, on this channel, we're not gonna be able to do a six foot by 10 foot painting. So what we're doing here is a simplified, smaller version, which some people may call a study. Up on the screen now is my simplified version of this Albert Bierstead painting. And my version here is pretty small. It's only 24 inches in height by 28 inches in length. If you're gonna paint along with me, which I welcome you and encourage you to, I'm setting up a grid here so that you could use this to transfer over to your canvas. This grid is one by one, so you could use it to scale up to any size you'd like. And down below in the video description, I'll have two videos I made on how to use a grid for your own paintings. We're going to be painting this one like a traditional oil painter. So we're going to be starting from that background, moving forward to the foreground. So the part that's farthest away in the background is obviously the sky. So what I'm doing here is mixing those colors. To start out, I'm going to keep this sky pretty monochromatic. So I'm only using two colors here, white and black. These two colors are going to be different values of gray, and I'm placing up the mixture on the screen right now. We're going to save some time by painting a pretty basic sky, but it's still going to work for the final landscape. For this sky, you could use any paint brand you'd like because we're going to be using opaques here to spray in the highlights. But for the rest of the painting, I recommend Createx Illustration Colors just because we're going to be erasing into that paint. The two brands of paint that work best for scratching and erasing techniques are Createx Illustration Colors and ComArt Colors. Brands like Golden and Liquitex are both fantastic paints. They're just not made to be erased or scratched into. Before I start painting, I want to add some frisket to the left side of this and cut out the contour lines along the outside of this large mountain. When we spray in the sky, this is gonna prevent any paint from getting on the side of the mountain, so we're gonna get a very sharp image of it because it's gonna be closer to us than the mountain that we're gonna paint first, which is farther away in that background. I don't really like rules in any sort of painting, but one general rule with landscape painting is that objects in the background are gonna be lighter. So this mountain far away is gonna have a lighter value. And as they get closer, they get darker and you also get a higher contrast. So darker darks and brighter brights. 
The reason for this is pretty simple. If you think about our atmosphere, which has a lot of moisture in it, as things are farther away off in the distance, they get blurred by that atmosphere. So everything really, really far away is always going to look softer than something closer to you. And of course, anything else in the atmosphere like dust, pollen, vapors are all going to affect this. I'm painting this on smooth canvas, which I prepared myself, and I'll have a link down below in the video description to show you how to make your own. And I'm spraying here at 20 PSI, which I'll be using for the whole painting. So what I'm doing here is essentially painting in clouds, which are going to be very soft in that background. I'm not going to go for a lot of detail. And the way I'm doing this is that I'm looking at that reference painting by Bierstadt and trying to see where I see shadows. As long as I use the airbrush freehand, I'm naturally going to get a very soft transition between one value and another. And this is going to work out very well for us for clouds. On the lower left hand side of the screen, I'm placing up my completed sky here so you can see what I'm working towards. If you're looking at the completed sky here and you kind of squint your eyes, you'll see that there's a gradient from left to right. The left side of it, it's lighter and as it moves over to the right, it gets darker. So what this means is that I want to try to spray less paint on the left and more paint over to the right. And on the right side later, I'm going to switch that second color to spray in those darker shadows that we see in the top right corner of the canvas. If we focus on the left side here, you'll notice that in this brighter area, there's different values of light and dark. And these are basically highlights and shadows of clouds. So wherever I see a darker area, which is a shadow, I just spray it in using the airbrush, letting the airbrush do all the work. I'm not using any shields. I'm just spraying freehand. This way, it's going to give me a very soft transition between those darks and lights. When you're painting in a basic sky like this, this is actually surprisingly easy to do. It's very important to exercise some restraint on how much paint you spray. Make sure you always spray a small amount of that darker paint. Let it dry for a few seconds and look at it. You could always go darker with some more layers later on. One of the great things about painting a sky is that there's a lot of room for error. You don't have to copy these exactly. You don't have to be very precise like you do in a portrait. It. Just pay attention to where you see any of those darker values and then try the best you can to use your airbrush to spray them in. A great thing that you can do is try practicing this on just a blank piece of computer paper. You could probably paint the sky every few minutes on a different piece of paper just using some grays. Again, just look at the reference here. Look at the one that I have up on the screen or look at a different sky that you know, maybe you find on Google and do the best you can to try to copy it. There's no tricks or secrets to doing this. The most important thing to remember though is really let the airbrush do the work for you. It's gonna give you those naturally soft blends and that's the key to making a sky look realistic. If we were painting a very advanced sky, there'll be times where you need to use some shields or some masks to get in some of those sharper lines and define the edges. But I painted this guy in simpler, so fortunately we don't have to use any of those tools just yet. Once those shadows are painted in, we have to now add some highlights to it. So there's basically two ways you can go about it, and the choice is really up to you. The first thing you could do is use an eraser to scratch out the paint, and you have to make sure that you're using an erasable paint like Createx Illustration or Comart Colors for this. And your other option is the one that I'm going to use for this one is using some opaque white paint to spray right over the top. I'm just using the eraser here to show you guys a basic demo of what this would look like. If I was painting a very advanced sky, I'd probably be using this technique. But again, we want to keep some parts of this simpler, especially this sky here. So I'm going to switch over to some opaque white and use that instead. With the white, I don't need the shield anymore, so I'm going to remove it. And you can see what this frisket does. It's just going to give us a very sharp line around the outside of this mountain. With this opaque white in the airbrush, again spraying at 20 PSI, I'm just going around any of these lighter areas and spraying this white over them just to help lighten them up. Of course, when we spray a lighter opaque color over a darker one in an airbrush painting, you're always going to get that blue shift. But for this painting, it's not going to matter at all because this is a sky. So if it shifts a little bit more towards some blue, it's not going to affect us or hurt us at all. And just like with the gray that I used before, I'm just spraying in everything freehand, constantly looking at my reference, wherever I see some brighter areas, I just try to spray them in. I know that this part of the video is sped up, so it looks like I'm doing this fast. I just have to keep the time down so these aren't too long. But one thing that I'm trying to do is not really jump around too much. When I start painting in a highlight, I kind of stick and stay in that area until I get the value to as light as I want it to be. And I think this is an important thing to do in painting. Try to focus on one small section so that you don't get overwhelmed. If you try to do the sky in one shot, 
it, it may overwhelm you and you may start rushing and giving up on it. So just take it one cloud at a time and just look at where those darks and lights are. And again, let that airbrush do the work for you. I can't stress that enough. The last thing I want to do is switch to that darker gray and spray some of it over the top of these highlights to make it look like there's some clouds in the background and especially add some of that darker value over to the upper right side of this canvas. If you're having trouble painting in the sky, just don't worry about it. You'll eventually get this down. I absolutely promise you that. It just takes a bit of practice. And remember, the best thing you could do is just take some sheets of copy paper and try to paint in a bunch of different skies over and over. Practice painting both simple and complex skies. And the next time you go outside, really try to pay attention to what you see when you look at the sky. Where do you see darks, lights, shadows, you know, and then transitions between those. So let's move along to the next part, which is going to be this mountain in the background. So before we do that, let's mix the color for it. I'm going to go for kind of a muted orange brown here. So the first thing I'm doing is starting with burnt umber and I'm adding 30 drops of that. I want this paint reduced, so I'm adding about 10 drops of distilled water to the mixture. I want to desaturate this burnt umber, so I'm mixing the complementary color, which is blue. So this is about five to seven drops of cobalt blue added to the mixture. After that's mixed up, it looks like this, which is still a little too saturated for me. So I'm using some sepia, adding about 10 to 12 drops of sepia. Once the color is mixed, it's going to look like this. And you can see that in this little cup, it almost looks pure black. These are transparent colors, so we're going to adjust our values by how much paint we apply to the canvas. And one thing I love about using an airbrush is it allows you to decide how much paint you want to apply. If you do this with a traditional brush and glaze layers on, it's very difficult to control, and an airbrush just makes it so much easier. With that color we just mixed, now in my airbrush, I'm starting on the left side of this mountain and working my way over. For those edges against the sky, I'm mainly going to be using a shield that I made myself. You could, of course, just use some ripped pieces of paper. Those will work just fine to give you nice defined edges along the outside of this mountain. For all the textures and highlights on this mountain, we're going to be erasing them out. And of course, in order to erase, we're going to need some paint down. So you'll see that as I paint in an edge of the mountain, I'll spray some paint just below it or to the right of it, just so I have some paint on the mountain, so I have something to erase into. The light source on the original Beerstadt painting is off to the right, so that means all highlights are going to be on the upper right-hand side of the rocks, and obviously all the corresponding shadows are going to be off to the left. Now within those shadows, you'll see that I'll use my eraser to kind of scratch into them and just add some textures to it before I switch back over to the airbrush like I'm doing now to darken them up. If you watched one of my last videos, which was on painting Dominique Ang's Princess de Brulee with the, the painting with the blue dress, um, the techniques that I use for painting that dress are actually very similar to what I'm doing with this mountain here. It's constantly add some paint, scratch into it, and then add some paint again. It's just this repetitive process over and over to get textures and contrast and values the way we want them to. The bad news about this is that it makes it very slow and time consuming, but the good news is you get a lot of control. So every time you add some paint down and you switch back to that eraser, if you didn't like the layer of paint that you put down, you could just basically erase it back out and start over. So it's just nice to know you have that room for error. I noticed on the original painting that most of these shadows have textures which are basically vertical parallel lines to each other. I'll paint most of those in freehand, but where I have an edge of a transition from one part of the rock to another, I'm going to use a ripped piece of paper here to paint that in. All I do is spray on the edge of the paper that puts the shadow behind it and gives me a very sharp defined contour line. I'm going to be using a fair amount of ripped paper for the majority of this mountain just because it helps give organic edges and kind of add some randomness to it. If you just paint it all in freehand, it's going to look just too soft. It's not going to look sharp enough to look like a mountain. And if I just use normal straight shields, the lines are going to be way too even and way too sharp. So just ripping up a sheet of copy paper really works well. If you're new to this style of painting, the eraser that I'm using is called a sand eraser or an ink eraser. I'll have a link for these down below. They're basically normal erasers, but they're just a little bit more aggressive. So they help remove paint much easier than a normal pencil eraser does, you know, like a white or a pink one. There are a lot of curves on the top part of this mountain. So I figured a piece of frisket would work best for me here rather than using shields that I keep moving around. So what I did was place this on and then cut into it 
So I just have the top part of the mountain exposed here. I'm not going to use this to paint in the whole thing. All I want to do is get a sharp edge there, which separates the mountain from the background. Now I say I want a sharp line here, but I don't want it too sharp because remember this mountain is in the background. So it is going to be softer than the objects which are closer to us. I just want to spray the paint toward the top here. Again, not spraying too much of it, just lightly laying it on there. And that's going to help define the line of the mountain against that sky. From here, I'm mainly going to switch over to freehand painting. I'll be using some ripped pieces of paper here and there, but I just want to make sure when I'm freehand painting that I'm not getting overspray onto the background, onto that sky. I want to make sure I try to keep it separated. So the Iwata Micron works very well here for me, just because it gives me a tight spray pattern. I'm always trying to experiment in painting. So what I'm doing here is trying out that skin texture template, which I've used in some of my portrait lessons on this channel just to see what type of look we can get in these shadows if I spray it over, see if I could help kind of break up that soft look that we get with the airbrush so there's something going on there. I wasn't crazy about the results I got from it, so you'll see I'll use this sporadically throughout this painting, but the majority of this can really just be done freehand using the airbrush and mainly that eraser for the textures. What I want to do here is use this paint to start painting in some of the shadows off to the left. So you'll see I'm going to work on this left side here using that shield and basically just mapping in blocks of shadow. While I do this, I'm also spraying paint in the surrounding area and where the highlights are because I will switch over to that eraser to erase the highlights out. If you look at my completed painting here on the left side of the screen, you'll see that we have a bunch of highlights and a bunch of shadows. Remember that every single highlight is always going to have a shadow. So for me, one of the easiest ways to go about this is start by painting shadows in first. This way, I know where they are and I know that the highlight is going to be off to the right of it because the light source is shining from right to left. So if you're working on copying this one, make sure that you kind of squint your eyes when you look at the reference and just pay attention to where you see darker areas and where you see lighter areas and then come in with your shield and start putting those darker areas in first. Let me slow this video back down to real time so you can see how I use an eraser for these highlights. The eraser I'm using here is called a Sun Dolphin Sand Eraser and I just kind of retrofitted it into a clutch pencil. You don't need to use this specific type of eraser. The other two that I've linked down below will work just fine. But what I'm doing with the eraser here is holding it pretty far back and you can see that I'm not really controlled with it. I'm kind of moving it around all over the place, trying to get weird textures from it, letting that eraser help me out and add some randomness to it. But while I'm moving it around, I'm still trying to stay in each highlighted area. So I'm not, you know, jumping in from highlight to shadow, adding textures to the shadow too. I just want to stay in a highlight area and kind of move it up and down, left and right, and see if we could add some randomness. I've talked about this before in other lessons, but one of the most challenging things for us as human beings is to get natural looking randomness in paintings. We naturally like things in order and neat and lined up. So you may find it hard to add in a random pattern like the textures on this rock. The way that I try to get around this is to hold the eraser pretty far back and then just try to be messy with it. Try to scratch left and right, up and down and do the best you can to try to get some randomness in it the best of your ability. I don't know if that makes a whole lot of sense or if I'm explaining it well, but the more you paint, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Now I'm going to speed some of this up so this video isn't too long, but I'm just working my way over on this single mountain from left to right doing just what I said before. I start with the shadows using a ripped piece of paper to kind of block them in and then switch over an eraser to start pulling out and scratching out some highlights. And right here for some of the textures in the shadows, you can see I'm just using the airbrush freehand, spraying in a bunch of little dots next to each other. And that gives you, it look like some sort of texture, you know, something's going on there in that shadow. Now I want to show you a trick that I like to use to add some more randomness to those highlighted areas. The tool I'm using here is a Dremel retrofitted with an electric eraser in it. If you want to use this, I definitely recommend just picking up a normal electric eraser. This setup that I have is kind of annoying. It takes a long time to change out that eraser. So I'm probably going to switch over to a traditional electric eraser from now on. But you can see as I'm using this, I'm going over those highlighted areas and then just kind of tapping this around. When you tap this to the surface of the canvas, it pulls out 100% of the paint. So you're going to get a very pure white highlight. Any highlights pulled out with the electric eraser are generally going to be too bright just because it's pure white gesso that we're seeing. So anytime 
these are pulled out, I'm always going to have to switch back to the airbrush with that initial color, that mountain color, and then lightly glaze that over the top. When I put some paint over the top, we'll still see those textures from that electric eraser, but it will darken and kind of soften up that area so it's not too bright. If you're going to use an electric eraser, one thing I recommend is start first with a normal eraser to erase into that paint. And that way you'll have those highlights kind of mapped in and erased out. And then from there to make them brighter, use the electric eraser on top of that. Because when you use a normal eraser, you can control how much paint you pull out by how much pressure you use. So you have a lot of control, but then with that electric eraser, you're always pulling out pure white highlights. For that reason, I like to use a normal stick eraser to pull out textures in the shadows, just because I'm not pressing very hard when I'm doing this. That way I don't have to pull out all the paint in the shadows, so I could still leave them dark. As you can see, I'm just going in these shadows with this eraser with some vertical strokes, which are parallel to each other, just to make it look like there's something going on in that shadow. This way it just kind of breaks it up and it doesn't make it look too flat and kind of gets us away from that soft airbrush look. From here, let's move along to the upper part of this mountain. And for the majority of this, I'm going to paint it in freehand to add in some of the textures uh, toward the top here. I don't want to add too much detail here because this is, again, it's going to be so far away that we want to try to create that atmospheric illusion where everything is soft and kind of blurred out. But I just want to follow that same procedure of putting down some paint and then constantly looking back at my reference, noticing where highlights are and then switching over to that eraser to pull them out. I know I say this in all my videos, but the most important skill you could ever learn is learning to see, noticing where highlights and shadows are, and then understanding your tools well enough, your airbrush and your eraser, to translate what you see onto the canvas. The good news about learning to see better and to notice details is that this just comes natural the more you paint. As you continually paint, you'll make mistakes and you'll start to notice the difference between your painting and what you're looking at. And learning how to spot those differences and correct them to the best of your ability is really what's gonna help improve those observation skills. And it's, it's almost kind of like an unconscious thing. You just get better at it the more you paint. So just keep working and don't worry about those mistakes because they're always gonna help you out in the long run. For the right side of this mountain, I'm gonna use some frisket just like I did before and then just very lightly spray over the edge of it to get that sharp to fine edge between the mountain and the sky. For the rest of this, I'm gonna speed through following the same procedure. I'm mainly painting freehand here. That frisket helped set that sharp line in the background. And then for the parts inside, spraying freehand is going to work just fine because if I need to sharpen anything, that's where the eraser comes in. So at this point, we're just over 20 minutes into this video and it looks like I painted this very quickly. In reality though, this whole painting took me just under two weeks, which is actually pretty fast for me. So it took me around like they say 50 hours or so, maybe a little bit less. And I've painted many landscapes before in the past. The reason I'm telling you this is that it's just so, so important to go slow and try not to rush. I would never imagine trying to paint this in one sitting. To me, that's just impossible. In today's time with the internet and YouTube, everything is just so fast and you see so many speed painters and, and people just completing things very quickly. But in painting, that's really a mistake. You want to work slow. You want to take your time and enjoy that process, that process of learning what you're working on and learning from what you're seeing. Just like reading a good book, I think it's very important to take your time and learn to slow down, learn to stop, walk away from it, and then think about it for a while. You know, maybe look at it an hour later and decide what you want to change. If you find yourself making mistake after mistake and then getting frustrated about your painting, it may just be that you're working too fast, so just try to slow down. So the next thing I'm gonna do here is use some opaque white, and what we're gonna do with this is spray this right over the top of this mountain. In painting, this is called a scumble, where you have a very thin layer of an opaque color dusted or lightly placed on top of a darker color. The reason I'm doing this is to push that mountain in the background to create that illusion that there's some distance here and there's clouds and an atmosphere so that this mountain is going to look farther away than the other ones that we paint later on. When you add a scumble of a lighter opaque color over a darker one, you're going to get a shift in the color temperature. And this shift is always going to be to a cooler value, so more toward a blue gray. You could see here in the before and after how much of a change we actually get just from spraying a light dusting of opaque white over the top. 
Just like before, I sprayed the opaque white at 20 PSI, but this time I didn't dilute the paint at all. And when you spray a thicker paint like this at a lower PSI, you get kind of a grainy look in the spray pattern. It isn't atomized as well as a thinner paint. And to me, it just creates a cool look for this atmospheric effect that we're going for. Now, this next part is pretty simple. To paint these mountains, which are really far away over on the right side of this painting, I just use some frisket and cut out the basic shapes of them. From here, I use that same lighter mountain color, just like before, lightly spread it in to give us a sharper defined line. The next thing I'm doing is using some of that darker sky color that we mixed in the very beginning of this video and spraying it over to the right to look like a clouds coming over that and then switching over to some opaque white and just spraying over the top of this, really pushing this part of the mountain far, far away back into that distance. So this is where I'm gonna wrap up the first part of this video. Next week, we're gonna start by finishing up the lower part of this mountain, which is closer to us. And then from there, we'll work on the closer mountain, which is off to the left, then the water, and then finally, we'll finish up with the foreground. So I hope you enjoyed the first part of this video. And most importantly, I hope you learned a thing or two. Maybe learned a bit about landscape painting in art history and also a few pointers to go about painting on yourself. So have a great week, be well, and I'll see you back here next Friday.